Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar, Fish Welfare in Aquaculture and Fisheries. As always, I'm Lucia Gai, the co-founder and the managing director of the Institute of Animal Law of Asia, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Institute of Animal Law of Asia, or ILA, is the educational research center that focuses on animal law issues in Asia and the world. At the ILA, we provide research projects which include animal law in Asian countries on topic, on category, and on species animal law articles. This year, we have launched um, two programs, uh, Enhancing Legal Regulations for Aquatic Animals in Kazakhstan and Farmed Animal Welfare in Mainland China that are supported and sponsored by the Center for Animal Law Studies, Lewis and Clark Law School. We also have our new source, Asia Animal Law Bulletin, which includes the latest updates on animals in Asian regions and countries. Last year, we launched the Alliance for Animal Law of Asia, which is an international networking campaign that aims to cooperate with national, regional, and global animal organizations to improve the awareness of animal protection around the world. You can support the work of the Institute of Animal Law of Asia by donating or sharing our website and materials. Recently, we have launched our own shop where you can make a general donation or fund one of our research projects or one of our animal law webinars or translation services. You can check our previous animal law webinars either on our website or on our YouTube channel. You can learn more about our work at ilasia.org or find us on social media. It's iAnimalLawAsia uh, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Today's webinar is organized under my project, Enhancing Legal Regulations for Aquatic Animals in Kazakhstan within the Global Ambassador Program launched by the Center for Animal Law Studies, Lewis and Clark Law School. This wouldn't have been possible without the Cal support. From our previous webinars, we were able to learn about the importance of aquatic animals in our lives and the entire ecosystem, as well as other topics involving animal protection. Aquaculture is one of the most pressing animal law issues and along with other types of farming, it causes pain and suffering to lots of animals. Our guest today is Jennifer Kirsch, the research and project strategist of Fish Welfare Initiative. Jennifer's work focuses on alleviating the suffering of fish in aquaculture systems and fisheries. We'll be answering questions after the presentation, so please leave your questions in the Q&A box. Thank you so much for being with us today, um, Jennifer, and uh, we look forward to learning more from you. Thank you for a nice introduction, Lou, um, and thank you everyone for joining us or if you're watching this on YouTube later for watching this webinar. I'm going to start sharing my screen here. And as Lou pointed out, I'm going to give a quick um, presentation, but I'd love to have time for questions in the end um, and answer anything specific you have. Just maybe upfront, I'm not an expert on law. Um, so if you have law specific questions, I can try to answer them, um, but I don't think I will be able to. Uh, I do have a pretty good knowledge on the more general um, things around um, suffering in those systems and just the general conditions on farms and in fisheries, which hopefully will help you kind of inform the decisions that you make on the law side of things. Um, and I also curated a little list of um, people that work in law that we previously were in contact with. So maybe that could be of help too. Um, so for this talk today, um, I wanted to briefly talk about the scale um, of fisheries and aquaculture, just to kind of set this into relation, like how big is the problem and what are we really looking at here? Um, then I want to briefly talk about do fish feel pain? Um, and the evidence for that because, well, disclaimer, they do feel pain. Um, but I briefly wanted to talk about um, the research in that uh, field and um, the evidence that they do feel pain. Then fish welfare and aquaculture and fish welfare and fisheries, just a quick overview over um, the current conditions, what are common industry practices looking like, and what impact do those common practices have on welfare. 
And then lastly, like I said, I'm gonna, I'm no legal expert, but I tried to gather some resources that could be helpful for everyone interested in legal advocacy. So hopefully um, those, you know, give you some insight. And I will stop with some key takeaways before the Q&A. So first of all, the scale. Um, so I previously worked in species conservation where it's usually you work on pretty big animals like, you know, elephants, lions, and all these animals where the numbers are pretty low, um, given, you know, that there's just not that many, they're very big, they're very spread out. Um, when I started working on fish, what hit me the most is just the sheer number of animals that we're talking about. So for farmed fish um, in aquaculture, there's 73 to 180 billion at any given moment. Um, and I, with that little graph below here, I tried to put this into perspective to the current number of people on this planet, which you can see on the left, and the current number of chickens um, farmed at any given moment. And fish is about more than twice the number of chickens, um, which is the second most farmed animal. And yeah, it's just, I think it's kind of crazy to think how many animals there are. And knowing about the scale of suffering that they often endure, it's even more scary because it's just so many individuals that really don't have much protection from a legal perspective, which translates to really bad um, conditions on farms. And when we're talking about wild caught fish, the numbers get even more incomprehensible for me. We're talking about 0 0.79 to 2.3 trillion uh, fish caught from the wild annually. And that's a really big range because no one knows for sure uh, wild fisheries. It's really hard to track what's going on out at sea. It's really hard to enforce um, catch limits. And so the numbers are very variable here. Um, but again, it's a massive number regardless. And even though we only interact with fish directly, um, with wild fish directly toward the end of their life, um, usually the scale of suffering we inflict is pretty big um, in fisheries because welfare is not a concern um, in wild caught fisheries. So the next question, do fish feel pain? And this is still, kind of like debated, even though from a research perspective, it really is very clear cut. Um, so first of all, fish have nociception. Um, nociception basically is the ability um, or the anatomical ability to process stimuli. Um, so that means that, for example, when you touch a hot um, stove, then your sensors on your skin would um, propagate that to nociceptors, which will ultimately get to your brain and it tells you, okay, move your hand away because it's gonna get burned and what you feel is pain. Um, so this leads us to the second point that as humans, we recoil from that painful stimuli. If you touch a hot stove and all your nociception is fine, you're gonna put your hand away. You're not just gonna leave your hand on there burning because you're gonna feel pain. Um, and the same has been observed for fish. There's experiments where, um, fish uh, were given, were injected with acid, which for them is painful, and they are trying to recoil from that painful stimuli, and they're actually also trying to relieve that pain. So for example, if there's two tanks and one tank has a um, pain, like a painkiller, um, for example, ibuprofen, dissolved in the water, the fish will go into that tank, no matter how scary that tank is to them. So for example, if it's really bright in an environment that they wouldn't like, they go there because they wanna alleviate their pain. So it's very clear that they try to um, avoid painful stimuli. They seek alleviation of that painful stimuli and they're ultimately altering their behavior in response to that painful stimuli. And all that shows us that they're able to feel pain and what's more important, it shows us that they're not even, they're not just able to feel pain, but it's a negative experience to them. It's nothing pleasant. It's something they're trying to escape. And in that sense, it's something that we should prevent from happening when they're our under care, our under care. Um, and yeah, there is like one really good quote from Victoria Braithwaite, who was one of the pioneers in fish uh, welfare research um, you know, 20 years ago. She actually passed away by now, but the quote just perfectly summarizes where we stand. Um, and it's saying there's as much evidence that fish feel pain and suffer 
as there is for birds and mammals and more than there is for human neonates and preterm babies. Uh, so that clearly shows we know that fish feel pain um, and I'm talking about fish. I'm going to talk about crustaceans and, um, for example, octopus cephalopods a little later. There's also evidence that they feel pain, but especially for fin fish, uh, we're very certain that they feel pain, that they have the ability to suffer. And not just that, they're also really smart animals. So there has been a recent movement toward positive welfare for fish. Uh, they're extremely smart, they're extremely social. Um, so on the picture, you see on the top, the orange guy, that's a grouper. And on the bottom, that's an um, eel, a moray eel. And they have been observed hunting together. Those completely different species, um, they basically form a short relationship, a short friendship where they hunt together. So the eel would go into the corals and into the rock formations, driving out prey fish um, for the grouper, which he then catches. And the grouper does the same thing later from the top, driving fish down into the rocks where the eel gets them. Um, so again, like a really interesting relationship that shows that those animals are very complex and they're able to have very complex social bonds, which is something that we usually attribute um, to rather intelligent animals. Now I wanted to show you this short video which shows how a fish actually uses tools too, which is something that is an attribute to many animals and it just shows that I think we grant them way too little um, attention and way too little of what they're able to do. Nope. One second here. There we go. And I thought that just shows very nicely how um, they're a lot smarter than we sometimes grant them to um, just swimming in a circle, you know, they're actually a lot more complex. Okay, so moving from here. Um, I want to go to fish welfare and agriculture. This is something that fish welfare initiative primarily works on. Um, so I'm going to have way more knowledge on agriculture than I do in fisheries. Um, we're working with farmers in India right now, but we have been to various countries and the conditions we found are rather similar um, across those countries in terms of what infringes welfare. But before that, I wanted to start out with a quick overview over fish farming systems, um, because this is something that is a little more complex than for terrestrial farmed animals where, you know, chickens, there usually there isn't that many different systems. I mean, you have the difference with cage free and non cage free, but for the most part, you're going to have a barn, you're going to have if they have free range outside, you're going to have some outside part, but it's pretty much the same system in which they live. Well, for fish farming, it's a little different. There are actually four different main system. And then there is a lot of in-betweens and combinations and all that. And they're all quite distinct and quite um, drastically different also in the type of welfare or the level of welfare they can provide. So the first one would be ponds. Um, that's kind of like your backyard pond, but imagine it on a really, really big scale. Um, usually natural water bodies kind of formed um, to fit fish. Um, sometimes they have a little plastic lining on the inside, but overall that's a system that's usually used for very extensive aquaculture, so smaller scale, um, fewer fish, and they're a little more natural, not much um, resource input usually. And then we have raceways, um, which are concrete tanks, um, or like you can see here with lined with rocks, whatever, but they're basically tanks and water flows in on one side, it goes through the tank, it flows in on the other side. Usually they're built on rivers. Those systems can have way higher stocking density because you have water flow, so your dissolved oxygen is going to be a lot higher in there. And um, the kind of level up from this is recirculatory aquaculture systems. And this is basically massive farms, like factory farms for fish, um, where they're in tanks inside a factory, sometimes outside and everything's controlled. So the water is being recycled into the system. There's no freshwater inflow. It's basically just all recycled within the system. There's a biofilter. Uh, stocking densities are extremely high, um, sometimes up to 10 times higher than they are in ponds. And overall there's, their feed is given um, 
to the animals, there's no natural like phytoplankton productivity or something that the fish would feed on. It's all like a very, very controlled environment with a ton of resource input. And the last one is sea cages. And that one is mostly for mariculture, so ocean fish farming. Um, and it's basically like the name says, it's a cage held up with buoys on the surface of the water and fish are held in that cage. And sometimes you can have a combination of RAS and sea cages. For example, for salmon, you would rear the juveniles in RAS systems, and then you would bring them to sea cages once they're smolting. Um, so once they hit the sea stage. And in all of these systems, um, you basically have six major issues that infringe welfare. The first one is water quality. And here we're talking about temperature of the water, we're talking about the dissolved oxygen content of the water, and we're talking about a ton of other measures like ammonia and pH. Um, but dissolved oxygen being the primarily one where in a lot of ponds um, or systems, the dissolved oxygen is really low. And you can imagine this a swimming fish swimming in there is basically like you walking in highly polluted air. So you can't really breathe the whole time. You only get very minimal air and it's just very stressful. You're probably gonna get a headache and um, yeah, it's just like you're near suffocation. And that's what those fish feel. If there's really dissolved, low dissolved oxygen, they can't filter enough oxygen out of the water and it's very stressful for them. And in the worst case, it can actually kill them. They're just gonna asphyxiate, which is the fish equivalent to um, suffocating. Uh, the second thing is slaughter. There is no good um, rules on slaughter in any country really. So uh, fish are often slaughtered just being put on ice. They're not effectively stunned. And that is a serious welfare concern, of course. Crowding, another issue. Fish are just cramped um, sometimes and that affects water quality, that affects uh, just their general well-being because they often then um, are aggressive to each other, they will bite each other. And it's just generally not a good situation for them to be in. Diseases and parasites, a really big issue for the industry. Um, this is probably the one that the industry is doing most to solve, not because of welfare, but because it actually kills fish and they can't sell them. Uh, but a really big issue, um, tons of diseases around and often really horrific for fish um, with like parasites that just eat them uh, basically alive and definitely um, a big welfare problem. Legislation and enforcement in many countries is a big issue. Fish aren't properly um, safeguarded for in law in any country. Um, so there is no proper legal um, protection in any country. Um, for my interpretation, at least, I don't think they're properly protected. Um, and enforcement, even if there is some basic laws, is a really big issue too. And then handling, often fish are handled really rough. Um, that still stems, or I think that still stems from the appearance that like fish, while well, they don't feel pain, so we can just throw them around, we can handle them very rough because it doesn't matter. And that leads obviously to serious welfare issues where also when they're just being put from one pond to the other, they can be seriously injured because people ha handle them way too rough. Okay, moving on to fisheries then. Um, there's a little bit of a different situation here because for fisheries, there's actually only interaction toward the end of a fish's life, um, as opposed to aquaculture where fish are literally under human care for the entirety of um, their life, or pretty much usually the entirety of their life. In fisheries, it's different. It's a little shorter of a time frame. It's usually maybe up to a few weeks max, depending on what capture method. Uh, but the intensity of suffering can be a lot greater. So there is extreme crowding, as you can see in the picture here on the right, those fish are still alive if they made it. Um, they're never stunned. So they're being captured like that. And usually they die because of decompression injuries when they're lifted through the water too fast, or because there's basically being squashed by other animals from the weight of them if they're on the bottom um, or because they basically get off the, the water they asphyxiate because they can't um, get the oxygen out of the air um, but yeah there's a lot of injuries involved usually they die a very long and painful death uh, fish can be out in air for up to two hours before they die 
So um, that process of them actually asphyxiating can be really long and painful. And um, there is like a whole different set of welfare issues for the different fishing methods, which I'm not gonna go into detail too because it can take forever. But I do have a resource at the end of the presentation um, where you can see the report that lists all the welfare issues um, for fishes in fishery. So if you wanna dig further into one specific method like bottom trawling, for example, you can find that in there. And I think one important thing to note too for aquaculture, there is definitely also environmental issues and so is for fisheries, right? Like a lot of the um, issues that we welfare are also issues with um, that lead to habitat destruction and ecosystem impacts and I think it's important to recognize that because we as the animal advocacy movement can probably work pretty closely with environmental um, protection movements in this sense because there is some overlap here we both don't like we kind of have the same end goal to stop a certain practice um, so we have found that quite helpful to kind of talk more to those environmental groups that maybe are outside our usual communication channels. Uh, yeah, and I briefly want to mention, um, it, this has been coming up lately and I think we should take it serious. What about other aquatic animals? Um, just last week, I read an article about the Australian government earmarking a ton of money to um, set up commercial lobster farms. And these things already exist on smaller scale. Um, but for example, shrimp, they're being farmed like a lot in India. Um, there's a ton of shrimp. The numbers are even higher than for fin fish. And we, we have very little research on their sentience, even though for shrimp and lobsters, we're pretty certain for cephalopods, like octopus basically too, we're pretty certain they're sentient, but there's like basically no legal protection. There's no practical protection in aquaculture system. There's no real groups focusing on these animals. Um, and they're very likely sentient. And I think we should keep in mind that there's more than just the fin fish, you know, the average salmon, tilapia, or carp. Um, there's a wealth of other aquatic animals that are exploited in these um, farming systems for food. And uh, we shouldn't forget them in our advocacy that they're out there. And, we should probably include them and try to avoid the industry commercializing in that area too. Okay, and now here comes my very basic um, few words about legal protection for aquatic animals and a few case examples that we worked with specifically. Uh, so to my knowledge, most countries don't recognize fish sentience. There's a few countries, and for example, the UK is introducing um, fish sentience, also crustacean sentience potentially um, in their next uh, bill. But there is usually most countries don't recognize fish sentience. If they do recognize fish sentience, um, they say something like, oh, you have to prevent unnecessary harm. But like with terrestrial farmed animals, that sentence is basically like it excludes farmed animals because that harm isn't unnecessary because they're being farmed for food right um and for them that's like well we can't really do something about that so even if their sentient is recognized usually there's not sufficient protection of their welfare the one law that is international and that for example kazakhstan is also part of um is the oie so the world um, organization for animal health aquatic animal health code uh, that code is pretty good in terms of mentioning a lot of things. It's pretty bad at being actionable. Um, so it says things like, oh, you should stun fish before slaughter. You should not use, um, you should not let them die out at air or put them on ice. But the thing is, they only use that wording should. Um, so it's only a recommendation. It's no binding um, law or something that companies or governments would have to adhere to. Uh, so it's good to point into the right direction, but you need another level of policy on top of that to actually make industry implement the recommendations that are made in the Aquatic Animal Health Code. Um, but that's a good piece of legislation, I think, that is at least a first step in the right direction if it is coupled with some um, policy that actually regards implementation and forces companies to implement it. 
And the law groups we work with, and I'm really sorry that they're mostly um, US or like the America centric. Um, we haven't worked with anyone in Asia yet, which is really um, why I'm so excited to be here right now and have heard of the Institute of Animal Law Asia, um, because I think that's wonderful that there's groups like that in Asia doing local work. Um, I wanted to mention the US ones and the one Chile one we work with regardless, because I thought if you wanted to get in touch with them, just to kind of hear what has worked for them to exchange ideas and brainstorm ways forward, uh, these may be some good ones to reach out to. Uh, I can give you contacts too, but they're usually pretty easy to reach. You can find an email on their website and they're pretty responsive. And for the first one, specifically the Richmond Law Group, uh, they've been ramping up their work on aquatic animals recently. And there is this company here called Red Lobster, which is a restaurant chain that serves like a lot of seafood, including lobsters that are held in tanks and you can actually choose the lobster you wanna eat. And they're all marketing them as sustainable and humanely raised. And uh, the Richmond Law Group actually called them out and they were like, no, we don't think your lobster or your seafood in general is humanely raised and we don't think it's sustainable. Um, and this is wrong, you shouldn't brand it like that. Um, and they've been having pretty good success so far. Um, so there's cases like that, that the Richmond Law Group has done recently that were pretty successful. So I think uh, we can probably learn a lot from them um, in terms of, yeah, how to make those companies stand up for what they say, right? They can't just say it's sustainable and humanely raised if it's not. Cool. And I'm already coming to the end here because I'd love to just have more time for questions. Uh, but the key takeaways are that fish can feel pain and they suffer greatly under common industry practices. Uh, they're also really intelligent animals. They form deeply complex social bonds. And I think they're generally a lot more aware of their surroundings and they have a lot more capabilities than we usually grant them. Uh, they suffer greatly under common industry practices in fisheries and agriculture. So both systems are prone um, to suffering. Fisheries, there's no research really. There's like no stunning equipment out there that's being used. So even more so, but in agriculture, the time frame they suffer is just so much longer. And there barely is legal protection for aquatic animals. Um, to my knowledge, again, you're probably the experts on this. But to my knowledge, I never saw a piece of legislation and we had different people look into it that was satisfying in terms of like, okay, that's actually properly protecting aquatic animals. I've never seen one. If you've seen one, I'd love to hear about it because I'd love to show other governments that look, there is actually a country doing this right. Um, but yeah, to my knowledge, I haven't seen one yet. Um, and that's the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, you can see my email here on the right. Um, you can see our website. You can browse there for articles from us, but also external articles um, if you're looking for anything specific. And I'd love to answer some questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for sharing your knowledge with us. It was very interesting. You mentioned the absence of um, legal protections for aquatic animals, and actually I've been doing some research on decapods recently, mm -hmm. and um, I know that New Zealand includes um, decapods in their Animal Welfare Act, and also um, Norway includes um, decapods and um, fish, mm -hmm. so I was wondering in in theory, if uh, if there was legislation in the United States, I know that the An Animal Welfare Act excludes fish um, as one of the categories of animals um, covered by the act. And if fish were included by included in the Animal Welfare Act, how do you think how do you think um, it would be possible to enforce the legislation practically? Yeah, that's a tricky one, right? I think. Um, I think all, all that those laws do is form the basis um, for any recommendations that you would make. So for example, we're working with certification schemes and it's easier for us to say, look, there is a law in your country protecting fish from harm. So you have to make sure that they're protected and these are the ways you can do that. Um, so certifications is one avenue, right? But other than that, if, 
I mean, again, it's hard because usually they say unnecessary harm. I'm not sure exactly what the wording is um, in the US, for example, but if they say unnecessary harm, my understanding is that the government itself has no incentive to change the status quo because farming isn't unnecessary per se. Um, so I think the only thing you could do is maybe an add on policy about uh, I know Scotland has this, for example, where they say, okay, you have to do, um, you know, certain industry practices like your sea lice numbers, for example, the number of parasites that your fish have have to be below a certain threshold. Otherwise, it's just illegal, basically, like you just can't do that and you're going to get fined for it. Um, and they don't do it for welfare reasons. They do it because they don't want massive fish deaths um, occurring. But I think something like that could work where you have laws and then you actually probably have to have them report numbers and maybe do some randomized checks on them. Um, that's the examples I have seen, but that's really labor intensive for the government, right? And I think there's very little incentive for them to do that unless you somehow link those welfare issues to productivity and efficiency issues too. Okay. Um... Now we can move to our questions. Um, so the first question is, um, while marine mammals have been elevated in the legal system and more recognized by the public than other aquatic animals, how do we effectively advocate for the fishes and persuade the government in their importance? Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, I think marine mammals are a lot more charismatic, which made it a little easier for us to advocate for them, right? It's a lot easier to say like, look, we should protect this really cute dolphin or this really cute whale because they're just adorable. It's a little harder for fish. Most people don't think that fish are cute. There's cute fish, um, but you know, if you look at a salmon, people wouldn't be like, oh, he's so cute. Um, so that makes it pretty hard, I think. But I we should shift that conversation from like, do they need to be cute? Like they don't really, right? And they have, like I said, they have a lot of that example with the eel and the grouper. It's just one example of them having really cool, like complex social bonds and just things that they do that we don't know of. Um, a really good book that I would recommend advocates to read is What a Fish Knows from Jonathan Balcombe. I can type the title in the chat right now. Um, but it's basically a summary of the cool capabilities that fish have. And I think if we can relay those cool capabilities to people while telling them about, look, and like, even though they're so sentient, they're so like, they're so interesting, they're suffering a lot under common industry practices. If we can link the two messages, I think a lot of people may consider you know, kind of like rethinking about fish. Like, do we really think they're not worth protecting? Yeah, there's there's been more light on marine mammals because they're just fascinating creatures. And, um, but yeah, I agree with you that the perception of um, other animals that are smaller or um, uh, receive less attention is just it's, it's just wrong to advocate just for cute animals yeah and it's a shame right because we love whales and we talk about their crazy migration routes but let's talk about salmon I mean they're amazing animals they're being born in a river they migrate all the way down the river and then all of a sudden they go into salt water you yeah know, that's that's so amazing <laughs> they managed to make all the way back up the river to their birthing ground without, you know, without a phone and Google Maps, like they just <laughs> um, to where they were born. Like, that's just fascinating, right? But for some reason, like, we tend to not grant them that that's like, that's pretty cool. Like, that's a really cool animal, if you ask yeah. me. Yeah, <laughs> that's just wow. Um, so next question is, um, I have a question that between aquaculture and fishing, which is the better option either for the environment or for the fish welfare? Hmm. Okay, that's a tricky question. I'm gonna <laughs> warn you, I'm probably gonna try to veer around it because I don't think that there is a one, like a yes or no for that or like a one or right. Um, 
I think from an environmental perspective, um, the issues you're looking at in fisheries are more larger scale, usually, um, if you're talking about habitat destruction. And it really depends on how the aquaculture system is managed. Um, so if you have a recirculatory aquaculture system that filters the wastewater, you don't have much effluence, right? Much wastewater. Um, if you don't have that, then you can totally destroy, like create dead zones down the line in rivers and in the ocean. Um, so it totally depends on the system. I don't think you can really say which system is better in terms of environmental um, harm or protection in that sense. Um, I think generally whenever it gets intensified, there's a problem. So I would say you can definitely make the case for intensification making it worse in both cases um, for fisheries and aquaculture. In terms of fish welfare, like I said, I would say the scale of suffering is far bigger in fisheries, a lot bigger. Like there's just, yeah, the scale is like far bigger, bigger numbers, but also bigger intensity. Uh, but the, the time for which they suffer is far longer in aquaculture. So it's almost, we personally made that trade-off focusing on aquaculture because we think that the time they suffer matters a little bit more to us personally. But I could totally see a group only working on fisheries because they say, yeah, but the scale of suffering and the intensity is just so big. So again, it depends what you're looking at. Are you concerned more about intensity? Fisheries is worse. Are you more concerned about the animal suffering for two years instead of two hours? Aquaculture is worse. Yeah, that's some food for thought. Thanks for this question. <laughs> um, next question is, um, in some occasions, arguing against, against fish industry can be considered as sort of racism because of targeting certain countries or, or people. How to avoid this issue? Yeah, thank you for the question, because I think that's an important question we should keep in mind. Uh, we shouldn't make this about races. We shouldn't make this about countries. Um, it is unfortunate that about 90% of fish are farmed in Asia. So already there, like inevitably, you're going to have some, you know, like focus on Asian countries as opposed to um, Western countries. But the welfare issues are the same. If you go to Norway, the fish are not leading a much better life than they would in China or something, you know. So we shouldn't forget that the welfare issues are present everywhere. But there is more fish being farmed in Asia. And we shouldn't also close our eyes to that just because we don't want to raise like racial issues. Um, I think a good way around this is never to make it about the country or the people that farm the fish, um, especially about the people in India, we work with the farmers and they're not bad people. They don't wanna, they don't wanna torture their fish. They wanna put food on the plate for their families. And they chose fish farming because someone down the line promised them to have good returns on it. They're not seeing those returns. So we're trying to help them to either, you know, maybe they can shift to a different system. Right now we're trying to help them to at least provide better welfare. Uh, but I think we should always work with industry because usually they're not the villains. Um, there's usually reasons why they went into this industry. Um, so I think, yeah, understanding people, talking to people, not having any prejudices towards them and not making it about the people doing the wrong thing or a country being bad in any particular aspect, but looking at a case by case basis and just generally seeing the fish are suffering it doesn't matter that this is in India, in you know, Thailand, whatever. They're suffering. What can we do to alleviate it and make that more the discussion rather than, oh, you know, Indonesia is really bad because they're treating their fish like that. Um, I think that's not productive. I totally agree. Yeah, I agree with you because it doesn't really matter to me who is catching fish or who is torturing other animals, uh, what country is doing that. Uh, as long as they're doing that, it, it is not right. And um, yeah, I think it's because of the maybe cultural backgrounds. Um, it is sometimes seen as some kind of racism. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we have the last question, or actually two. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, do you believe in sustainable aquaculture? And the second, do you believe we can stop fishing altogether in the near future? Okay, so sustainable aquaculture. Um, 
So we advocate for sustainable aquaculture in terms of fish welfare. We think there is a big overlap. Um, so we think that if you improve welfare of fish, you inevitably improve um, uh, sustainability. So in that sense, I would say we are advocating for it, but only if that means that fish welfare is improved, right? We don't advocate for sustainability for sustainability's sake, because you can improve sustainability to some extent without ever caring about welfare, and that's not the goal we have. Um, but it does come hand in hand and lower stocking densities, um, fewer antibiotics, just better care for the fish. That's all stuff that improves sustainability and it improves welfare. So in that sense, do I believe in it? I think a lot of it is humane washing. Um, I don't think you know there is perfectly sustainable aquaculture because it's still a animal farming system. Like it's hard to make that sustainable. Uh, but I do think it's maybe, it's a good strategy to push fish welfare into that sustainability thing because industries will strive to go towards sustainable agriculture. So if we can push fish welfare in there, we might as well hop on the train and, you know, make it right and include a little bit more into that image of sustainable other than the environmental aspect. Um, so in that sense, yeah, I think it's a good tool. I think we should be very aware of humane washing um, with that word sustainable. It's very overused and across all different industries. And uh, the second question about ending fishing, uh, I hope we can end it at some point. Um, I think there is a big, um, so we at Fish Welfare Initiative, we're not trying to end anything. We're trying to work with industry to improve their practices. Um, Personally, I think that if we want to end fishing and factory farming, we need alternatives, right? I think we can't do that. We won't convince everyone to stop eating fish or seafood. So what we will need to do is we need to offer alternatives that are equally nutritious, equally tasty, and have a cheaper price tag. And I think the last point is where we're kind of struggling right now, right? Scaling up. Um, the alternative um, seafood products and actually offering them to the large scale market at a price tag that's cheaper than the conventional seafood. And I think without that, I think we can push welfare and we can push people to consume less seafood. But I think without pushing the price tag down of alternative seafood, I think that's essential to achieving the goal if you want to completely end seafood culturing and seafood capture. Um, so yeah, we we'll probably have to work a lot on that end too. Yeah, that's true. Uh, well, that's it for questions. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. It was very informative and I hope um, our audience will find it um, helpful too, and they can learn more about fish and their sentience. Um, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel soon. So you can just either check our website or go to our YouTube channel. Um, thank you so much for being with us today and have a great day. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for organizing this, Lou. <laughs> Bye. Bye.